23 years the environmental advisor in the World Bank in Washington, D.C. Uh, it's a br branch of the United Nations. And I, one of my um, um, main goals, well, a first goal was to stop them um, doing something which seems now so black and white and so such a no-brainer that you just won't believe me. And that was they used to spend, they invested a lot of money lending for in increasing tobacco production, can you believe it? And it took me 10 years to the day before I got a, a mandatory pol policy uh, passed prohibiting use of World Bank funds to finance uh, tobacco production. And one of my next targets was uh, stopping the bank um, investing in, in large-scale scale livestock, uh, particularly from the Amazon basin, where I... <laughs> thank you, thank you, thank you. <laughs> particularly from the Amazon basin, which is where most of China's beef comes from now. Uh, I misspent most of my youth in the Amazon, tromping up and down, and I love the place. And so it was such a shame to see um, it uh, cut and burned, often by slaves, according to the Brazilian government, um, and then put over to cattle pastures, which only last three years because the soils are so weak that the cattle eat everything, then they have to cut down more forests, so it's totally unsustainable. But I want to invoke the name of someone you probably have all heard about, and you, many of you, most of you, probably admire him, and that's uh, the Silicon Valley son, namely Bill Gates. A anyone not heard of him? <laughs> no, yeah. good. Well, um, he is on your side, so I hope you'll encourage him and uh, be strengthened by him and try and join him if, if you want. Uh, he said, replacing animals raised for food with virtual meat, dairy and eggs made with no animals, that's his goal. And such changes in food and agriculture impressively reduce three things, natural resources and energy, greenhouse gas emissions, that GHG you'll see a lot, it's greenhouse gases, mainly carbon dioxide, but often a uh, lot of methane too and N2O, um, that even than the changes we've seen in communications. Do you remember when a television, you could scarcely lift it, and, and, and uh, now it's just a tiny flat screen? So, and now uh, mobile phones are swept throughout the world. So poor people are really having improved lives because of uh, mobile phones based on solar electricity too. Um, and then he went further on YouTube. He said all these companies using animal products, milk, egg, chicken, beef, can innovate into plant-based materials, soy, peas, to make products cheaper, healthier, with less cruelty, less greenhouse gas emissions. And then he said, this is phenomenal, it's huge. Five years from now, he predicts that when these products get out there, we will all see what exactly innovation can cause. Um, he went further to say, ripe, uh, food is ripe for innovation. I fully agree, and many of the speakers here today um, have emphasized this point that uh, our food system is ripe for innovation, overdue, I'd say. And um, Bill Gates and his other Silicon Valley millionaires are now betting money on his vision that food is ripe indeed for innovation. And his key point is making regular foods using plant-based materials emitting far less greenhouse gas. And he said, while it's not mainstream now, he predicts that it will be by 2017, which is very near. Um, I know that my talk has sort of changed gears. I was extremely pleased to hear all this morning's speakers who really uh, taught me such a lot and inspired me and encouraged me to keep on because sometimes it's pretty hostile atmosphere out there. But my talk is not so much on nutri uh, nutri nutrition, it's on uh, how a change in your diet, and I submit I'm going to say it's a rather modest change, um, is possibly the only way to prevent climate catastrophe. That sounds a pretty strong prediction, doesn't it?
but I hope you'll bear with me and, and tell me if it's uh, holes water at the end of my talk. My co-author, um, who aids and abets me, Jeff Anhang, uh, we both come from the same old school time, McGill University in Montreal. <laughs> but he couldn't come, unfortunately. Uh, but you write to him any time you need some really technical um, encouragement. Uh, we analyzed World Watch's um, FAO, Food and Agriculture Organization's um, uh, calculation that 18% of anthropic man-made uh, greenhouse gas is from livestock. We recalculated as 18%, and we uh, were staggered with our own conclusions. We found that far being wasn't 19% or 17%, on our calculation, it says it was a whopping 51%, and all our assumptions to get to 51%, we went through them many times, one by one. They're all a bit conservative. If we had any doubt at all, we erred on the conservative side and took a lower figure. But even so, it's 51%, according to us. We say that the only pragmatic way to reverse climate change by 2017 is to replace one quarter, 25% of today's livestock with better alternatives. That's the sort of key finding we have. Uh, let me just note that 2017 is when all of the really world's top um, climate scientists, James Hansen uh, and IPCC and the International Energy Authority, that's when they say is the first tipping point and it, it won't be as suddenly until July the 1st, 1917, but during 1917, that's when some tipping points will be reached, and many more probably in, in 2018. So that's the origin of the 2017, and I, I belabor that point a bit because it's so near. You know, as, as I get older, the, the weeks used to flash by, now the months flash by, and the years also starting to flash by. So we really don't have much time if, if 2017 really has some severe tipping points. Um, <clears throat> now, those of you, and I hope there are many, who want the whole world to become vegan, and I agree with the last speaker in that delicious cooking session, uh, the only choice is between becoming vegan voluntarily on your own speed and your own terms and by educating yourself or having it shoved down your throat involuntarily if you let climate change dictate the speed of the transition. So that's a very important point I think she meant and I really loved it. Um, so anyway, we don't say everyone in the world has to become vegetarian by next week, vegan by next week. <laughs> Uh, but we do say if you want to meet all of the climate targets, you know, starting with um, Kyoto and through Cancun and Copenhagen and Bonn and now there's another one somewhere, um, all of those targets, of course, are just laughably missed uh, by a long way. Um, and they can all be met by just a modest reduction in everyone's livestock consumption by 25%, which I think you must agree I know that's not our goal here. Our goal is 100% uh, vegan. Uh, but even non-vegans um, shouldn't find it very difficult to reduce their livestock consumption by 25%. But we haven't got 10 or 20 years to change out of uh, fossil fuels and into renewables. As I said, it's now the best date that I've got from the literature is 2017. We have to... Um, reach some form of climate <coughs> instability. So uh, phasing out of coal and oil, which all of the climate people think is the only hope, um, it is not going to do it because it, it, we have to do it so quickly. And after 2017, then phasing down uh, atmospheric uh, greenhouse gas won't matter much because it'll be too late. Just to mention a few of the terrible um, aspects of this. Um, 1,700 US cities, including New York, Boston, and Miami, uh, will be submerged from rising sea levels as a, as a result of climate tipping points. And that includes, the 1,700 cities includes your own um, Silicon Valley. 
And the only way to stop that um, is by expensive new dikes and levees to hold back the rising water. Now, that is a, a, another extremely expensive uh, mega engineering, which also has its own um, impacts, which have not been looked into. And uh, you, you can read any day about the Army Corps of Engineers' um, ill-designed levees in, in the lower Mississippi and how much uh, grief they call, cause for New Orleans and other places, and not even protecting the main place they're supposed to protect, New Orleans. Um, and for some of those 1,700 cities, the point of no return may come before 2017. And where it's going to come first is in some of those um, uh, limestone atolls in the mid-Pacific, which are only about a, a meter above normal sea level anyway. They're absolutely terrified because uh, just a few centimeters rise in the sea level will submerge them and kill all their crops. And um, they're going to have to all relocate somewhere. And of course, they don't know where. The world is too full already. But the International Panel on Climate Change and the International Energy Agency warn that major action by 2017 may be the last chance to reverse climate change before it's too late. That's a sort of bottom line schedule or timetable. And it seems to me that there's surely no more compelling motivation for action than replacing that modest amount of livestock with better alternatives. And as I mentioned before, that indeed may be the only pragmatic way to stop climate catastrophe for imperiling much life on Earth. So, reducing my talk to a few slogans, not the slogans are a good way to go, but uh, some take-home messages, because I guess you get a lot of take-home messages. Um, first, halt deforestation and fires from ranching and feed production. Second, reduce livestock consumption by 25%. Third, maximize greenhouse gas sequestration by reforestation. And the added bonus to this solution is that it will create many jobs worldwide, especially for women who are so good at collecting seeds and, and nurturing them in a nursery and, and uh, tending the saplings and seedlings. And here is an even pithier slogan to take home. <laughs> greenhouse sequestration must exceed greenhouse emissions as soon as possible. Thank you. Godspeed. Unfortunately, or fortunately, you know, I, did, I, I knew pretty much what the speakers were going to be like this weekend. Mr. Goodlin was an unknown. He, he was the one wild card for this weekend. I didn't know what he was going to do, what he was going to say, whether he was going to be good or not good. But I, I could hardly sleep last night. From, from his message, and you know, and, and I left this. Could you have a seat here just for a minute? I just want had a couple of questions for you uh, because I couldn't leave what we uh, had uh, discussed yesterday. The important things that you told me about how we have decisions to be made based on Hansen's uh, important environmental studies. We got decisions that have to be made in the next three to four years. Yeah. And, and you said, if I heard right, that there's only one card on the table. What I want to know, first of all. Is, is it hopeless or can we do something if we all get organized, we all get focused, we get our friends and family, our businesses, everything? Is it worth it? Of course it's worth it. But can we do it? Do you think that seriously, if the things that you recommended, we did, there is hope for my children and grandchildren? Yes, there is hope, no doubt about it. But it's going to take a huge effort, more effort than we've ever seen. It's going to be. It has to be something like uh, the Marshall Plan after World War II. It has to be a, an emergency plan on an unprecedented scale, and it has to start now, not in two or three years' time. That's hopeful, isn't it, that we, that we can make a difference? I know some of you are offended by this kind of discussion. Uh, I, I, I hope and pray that I'm wrong. I hope what uh, Robert Goodwin has to say is incorrect, but what if he's right? And we can make a difference, and we look back and we said, we could have, but we didn't. We could have. I mean, you told us we could make yeah, a difference. Yeah. Uh, how, what's the chance of getting Bill Gates seriously involved in this? Yes, I think we should try. Yeah. I think he's more than, he's off the fence. He's on our side. 
he needs encouragement, but you can give it to him. So there are people out there that can make a difference. You have friends, you have relatives. Yeah. Uh, Bill Gates is invited. <laughs> you know, anybody, yeah. Barack Obama, uh, anybody, Putin, anybody <laughs> is invited. <laughs> we are not discriminatory. <laughs> anybody is invited. Uh, uh, I, I know this is a, a huge leap to even think that any possibly could happen, but the stakes are so great. Yeah. And, uh, and as I said, I didn't rest well last night. Not oh, that sorry. your message was new. Yeah. It certainly wasn't new, but you said it so clearly. Oh, good. And I think many of the other people felt the same way I did, is if you believe, and there's every reason for you to believe, because if we're wrong, uh, it, the consequences are so serious. Uh, I, I wanted uh, Mr. Goodland to come out and, uh, and tell us that they, if we put the effort into it, we will make a difference. Yes, yes and we, we will. will. But it, the beauty of it is you as individuals are already part of the solution. You have become vegans. Now, the next step is to extrapolate your efforts and get your neighbors or your church or your school or your company to go at least towards that route, towards that goal. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> All right. Okay, we're going to take... Uh, we're going we're to take a, about a 15-minute break. I hope uh, uh, Mr. Goodland's <clears throat> final words uh, give you not, not comfort. Uh, comfort's not the right word. Give you energy, enthusiasm to go out and to share this message and to make a difference, uh, not just for our sake. Most of us are too old to really be able to appreciate it. But we have kids and grandkids. We have a world to save, and we can do it. Thank you. <clears throat>